everyone. Welcome. We're happy that you're here. Uh, today is Tuesday, March 13th. We are in the voting meeting agenda, and we will begin with roll call. Mayor Mangarelli? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Orr? Here. Councilman Blair? Here. Councilman Good? Here. Councilman Lemerson? Here. Councilwoman Scholl? Here. And Councilman Sishka is not here, and he's excused. Thank you, Maureen. Um, last week, the city of Prescott lost an amazing citizen that contributed much to our community. Tom Mincer had been a resident of Prescott for 24 years. Mr. Mincer served with the city of Prescott in the following capacities. Planning and Zoning Commission, 19 years, and was our current chair. Advisory and Appeals Board, 21 years, current chair. He had been uh, on the Prescott Board of Adjustment for two years and Unified Development Code Committee for 17 years current chair until March 2018. Tom Mincer will be deeply missed and his family uh, are in, they are in our thoughts and our prayers. So as we do our dedication, uh, let's remember Tom Mincer. And first we will have our pledge, Councilwoman Show. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Rabbi, our dedication, thank you. My deepest sympathies to you all, all of you. Honorable Mayor, council members and staff, community members and friends. So here we are again, ready to face continually changing challenges of the basic needs we have as a community, housing and breathing certainly rank high on the list. With the presentations for today, I have hoped that one day I will be able to folk dance in the park without the threat of respiratory arrest from smoking individuals. I just not. I have a severe adverse breathing effect from exposure to even minute amounts of tobacco. So we all pray that you, our leaders, will be blessed with compassion and respect to allow all in our community to be able to enjoy the beautiful areas open to the public without the risk of adverse health effects. May you also be blessed with wisdom, understanding, and creativity to be able to protect the people you serve and the environment we all live in for us now and for future generations. Whether it be in housing, health benefits, or other basic needs such as safe food, safe water, and safe air, may you put the welfare of our people first above all. In affirmation of these fervent prayers, let each of us in our own way now agree, so may it be. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi Popkin. So we have three presentations. The first one will be Peg Travers with Pickleball Association. How's that? Good. I want to thank you, um, Council, um, for allowing the Prescott Pickleball Association to once again come here. It's been 10 short months since many of you joined us to um, open up the pickleball courts. Our formal dedication was in September, but in May we opened the doors, um, actually the gates, uh, um, 7 a.m. there were about 50 people waiting to play. Yeah. And it has been that way for um, most of the time since we have uh, opened up the gates and people are playing. It's so exciting. And we are grateful that you all supported us when we asked for your support to build the courts. It is a public-private partnership. And for those of you who don't understand that, that means that 
private citizens came and we all came together and made this possible. I would like to introduce as well Kevin and Mary Costa. You want to stand? Kevin um, is our new vice president of the Prescott Pickleball Association. So we are very grateful for his volunteerism as well. The courts are full. And um, they are full. We've um, been working happily in conjunction with our Parks and Recs people. Joe, we're very appreciative for the time and effort Joe and his staff have put forth for um, us to be able to um, manage the courts. We've developed schedules together. We identify programs that the um, community wants, and we um, try to make the courts as well utilized as we possibly can. Last year we had um, two tournaments, and this year we will also have two tournaments and other events as well. What we're trying to do at the courts is make them as desirable to the general public as possible. So most of the programs that we offer are open to the public, uh, we do have about 200 members in our Pickleball Association right now. Many of those people volunteer to wash the courts, put up a storage shed. If we all decide that we want to make them a little prettier, then we um, put out an email and people come and help. It's pretty exciting. I notice you're, you're looking at our um, handouts. We've given you some information that we've recently printed and uh, some examples of what we um, are using for um, to, to put out our events. PrescottPickleball.com um, is our website. And I want to tell you that we get calls every week. In the Sweetheart Round Robin, we had a, a couple come from Canada to play. It's not uncommon to have people come to the courts and say, I'm looking at the houses here. And I wanted to see what your pickleball facility looks like. So July is for juniors. Last year, we tried hard to put together a junior program, but it just didn't happen. So this year, Kevin and a number of other people are going to have a, um, they're going out to the schools now to encourage students to come. We want to get as many kids on the courts as possible. Um, and uh, there will be clinics and competition for the, the kids in July. That's free to the public. We'll provide the paddles, and we provide the, the uh, teachers. We will also have lessons. We, uh, pickleball is the fastest growing sport in the United States. I know you've all heard that. A lot of people want to learn how to play. We'll have lessons at the courts. We will also have clinics. Uh, for those people who are looking to improve their skills. Okay, here comes the pitch. <laughs> Four more courts. We um, saw that the um, public um, recreation department had put a um, in their five-year plans for more courts. We, when we built these eight courts, we knew that it wasn't going to be enough. And I said to Joe, oh my gosh, five years. And he said, and it could get bumped too. And I said, gosh, I, you know, I'm not getting any younger. So we decided that we were going to um, start a four more campaign, start to earn money, uh, get donations so that we can help the city pay for more courts. So our campaign is already underway. Our goal is 75,000. We have 4,100 to date, and we haven't even started um, really going out to the businesses and other places trying to get more um, donations from businesses, and we hope to partner with some. Qu 12 courts will help us, and um, for anybody that understands anything about pickleball, the USAPA is the, is the um, United States American uh, Pickleball Association. If we um, get 12 courts, then we will be a tier two feeder for the nationals. This year, our uh, J June program is going to be USAPA sanctioned, which is huge in the pickleball community. We've already got 
about 100 people signed up for the, uh, for the tournament. And remember that when we bring in money that goes into the Arizona Community Foundation and it sits there for us to um, hopefully help the city with pickleball needs. So the question is, will the city council endorse for more? We're not asking you to pony up money just yet, but our efforts, we'd like to know that you're behind us. Any questions? Any questions or comments? Thank you, Peg, for your presentation, and Welcome. thank you to the thank you. Pickleball Association and all you've done for the city so of Prescott. There's no comment about whether or not you're going to endorse? At this point, um, Mayor Pro Tem, because it's agenda as is a presentation, right. any sort of discussion, promotion, endorsement, or decision should be agendized separately thank at a you. future meeting. Right. Okay, thank yeah. you. Well, we appreciate all you've done. Thank you very much. Second presentation, the noise that you're hearing is Mayor Mingarelli online here. <laughs> so we have a presentation now, uh, Brent Hatch. Uh, thank you for giving me a few moments to speak to you today. My family and I moved from the valley for two reasons, the weather and on our doctor's recommendation that the clean air here in Prescott would be beneficial for my family's pro breathing problems, especially my wife. The city of Prescott promotes itself as one of the happiest and healthiest cities in America, according to its website. We love to walk around the parks, the courthouse, which is owned by both the Avapai County and the city of Prescott. And its uh, responsibility for maintaining is half of the, park, uh, of the walkway. As we've begun our life here in Prescott, we've enjoyed the clean air and everyone that has, everyone has told us about. Uh, but on the other hand, we've noticed a stark contrast in the air quality around the public parks and the courthouse due to the amount of cigarette and tobacco found there. My wife and children cannot walk or play or even visit the events around the courthouse because of the sensitivity to the smoke. My wife's asthma flares up due to the exposure of the smoke. One breath will f can physically and has physically disabled her. Um, furthermore, we believe that we deserve the same equal protection under the law of the America with Disabilities Act of 1990. The definition of the ADA Act was changed in 2008 to read that the basic definition of disability is an impairment that substantially limits one or more major life's activities. Just like we don't want to deny a disabled person or anyone for that reason the right to walk in the park, we don't want to deny my family and other families the same rights and privileges. I've spoken to a lot of people here in town and a lot of them have made the statements, it's about time the city does something to prohibit smoking in all city and county parks. I've spoken with people in the city who have been smokers most of their lives and said if the city passed this, that it would probably help them quit. I've also asked the downtown partnership their opinions and they agree that smoking has gotten out of control. One of the owners said that she is a smoker and she knows she needs to quit and maybe this would help her um, also. You have the power to make this happen in this great city of Prescott. We voted for you because we wanted to see meaningful and lasting change. So please consider making these adjustments. I'm only one person, but I speak for many people in the city um, that have given up this fight because they're too tired of asking and getting no results. Let's come together and make this happen. Please work together with the Avapai County to make Prescott even a greater place to enjoy with our kids and grandkids. Um, I also uh, started with uh, my family and some uh, youth here in town and they've started a petition and we also have some youth uh, that are signing it to, to see what they can do to help this. Uh, I read a quote from Albert Einstein that said, the world is a dangerous place, not because of those who do evil, but because those who look on and do nothing. And I'm one of many who have looked on and see that this is a problem. Um, about three weeks ago, my wife and I were walking around the park, and she, um, we went early in the morning because there's not that many people up, and a couple right in front of us lit up and started smoking. As soon as she took a breath, she, um, we had to go home, give her all of her butyrol, all the medication that she needed. It got worse, so I had to take her to the emergency room. And they gave her shots of steroids that helped her. Then we had to go down to the valley, which it, her breathing took about three weeks to finally get better. And we've been married for a long time, and I want her around a lot longer. Um, but again, we moved up to, to Prescott on doctor's orders because down in the valley, it was, it was, she was always having a hard time. That's without smoke. But since we moved up here, her, her asthma is pretty much left, except for the smoking. There was also a couple I was trying to get to come today that were visiting Coronado, and his wife had the same problem. And she fell to the ground, stopped breathing. The mayor's uh, secretary was there, saw it, took her to the hospital. 
they made a presentation, they voted in Coronado, they have no smoking anywhere. Um, and I think we have a lot more in common um, than you think. The mayor has nine children, I have seven. And we want the best for them. Mayor Pro Tem Billy Orr has been married for 43 years, I've been married 32 years. Steve Blair has been a business owner for 44 years, I've been in business 35. Phil Good was on Jeopardy and Tic Tac Toe. I was on Family Feud twice and I lost both times. <laughs> Alex Scholl was a Girl Scout and I'm an Eagle Scout. Steve Shiska loves to ride motorcycles and play golf. I'm really good at miniature golf. Jim Lamerson says it's the right thing to do and I believe that you guys will make the right decision here um, because we have new people in here and you know, I, I, I believe people who want to smoke have the right to smoke but I also believe that people like myself, who, who it affects us adversely, have the right to breathe fresh air, and that's why we're here. Brent, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Nicely done. Thank you. Our third presentation is from uh, Dr. Fairbanks, Dr. Leland Fairbanks. Well, I'm the old country doctor, Grandpa Leland Fairbanks, came here to work with the American Indians as a doctor in 1958, and I'm still on the board at age 87 because they won't let me leave. <laughs> Although I am turned out, they keep appointing me. And then I like to get good, uh, solid support from everybody, and I've got solid support from this guy. He's the executive director. I'm Leland Fairbanks, I live in Tempe, Arizona now, although I've traveled these trails up here many times working with Native Americans, uh, and was the one who helped many of your citizens out here get the signatures in 2003, so the city of Prescott got the initiative passed by the citizens in 2003 that swung the state. No action any place else has the impact of you, the old capital city, the center of Arizona, where Senator Barry Goldwater came to launch his campaigns, Senator John McCain launches his, and I had one of the greatest public event feelings I've ever had to say thank you to the city of Prescott that I've ever had. And that was in 2003, the evening when the votes were being counted on whether Prescott, the old city of the West, and the city of Whiskey Row was going to vote to continue smoking in the bars and the restaurants and the other facilities and down around the courthouse, or whether they were going to vote for smoke-free bars and restaurants and public places. I was invited to be with a Board of Supervisors meeting up for Coconino County in Flagstaff. And we were listening kind of out of one ear for the election results coming from Prescott while they were talking about Coconino County trying to get rid of smoking in places that bothered them. And some of the bar owners in Arizona Licensed Beverage Association people, they were over on the side at the start of the meeting and they were doing the high fives. We're going to win a vic victory for our right to keep smoking in the bars as long as we want. Wow! In Prescott, they're voting. We're going to be celebrating tonight. That's the way they started. But as the radio reports came in, one of the person who went out to listen on the radio came in and he said, Folks, no high fives tonight. Prescott, the city where it's the center of the old west, and they're the people you really count on, the solid citizens. They voted tonight for smoke-free bars, and the battle's over, really. Because when Prescott does it, the state's going to do it. And so... When we, on the way out, uh, some of them said to me as old country Dr. Grandpa, well, uh, we're never going to criticize you in public again. We used to call you the old um, 
health czar and Taliban health czar and a health tyrant, but we're all brothers and sisters and we'll, we'll be walking together from now on. So I think whatever you do has more impact than any place else. And I think the signs help. Now, for the state, you need to get these little signs, you know, to put on the, on the door that's your smoke-free workplace. Or you can get the, the slightly bigger signs for the state law. I see many places don't even have any signs up, or at least they didn't use, so I hope that's changed. They're violating the law. They could be prosecuted for violating the law, the places that don't have any signs up. But here's the signs that we have found that do much better. This sign does much better. It informs people. How do you know what the speed limit is without a sign? How do you know there's a school without a sign? How do you know without a, there's a church without a sign? And to find our place here, we got information that helped us find the place. And so this is the sign that does more good on getting rid of smoking than 10 policemen. Because when that sign is up and it says, no smoking, including e-cigarettes, at the, as you first enter the property, people know the rules before they, don't, before they light up. And when you have that kind of a sign up, and I've, my wife has asthma, so I have uh, been married 64 years to my wife. She has asthma. So I used to, before the laws, I used to ask, please, would you not smoke? to bother my wife's asthma, and they wouldn't stop. But places where they have the signs, I don't even have to say anything other than, oh, folks, see the signs, you can't smoke here. And they reluctantly, even the most diehard smokers, put out the, the smoking materials. So I say, lead from Prescott. And just like they said 15 years ago, when Prescott votes, for no smoking in the bars and keeping the air clean. It's gonna go. And I do thank you very much. I thank people you've all treated me with such respect. Uh, I'm very grateful for that. I believe really we are all brothers and sisters, wherever we are, wherever we come from. And the golden rule is the guide that I've grown up with. And that applies for people, whoever they are, Wherever they came from and who their parents were, we're all walking together. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fairbanks. We appreciate your presentation. Thank you. So we will move on to our consent agenda. Clerk Scott, I think we have some items that have been pulled from the agenda. Yes, item B and item D. Item B and item E. B, B and D. B and D, thank you. Thank you, so do I have a motion to um, Mayor Pro Tem, pass in? Thank you. Move to approve uh, items A, C, and E on the consent agenda. Second. second. We have a, a motion and a second. I'll vote, please. I'll vote in favor of that. Thank you, Mayor. It passes 5-0. Thank you. Oh wait, Lammers, Miss Councilman Lammerson, let's do that one more time. <laughs> um, Mayor Pro Temor, can you do it one more time, please? Sure. It passes six zero. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Councilman Good, I understand that you pulled item B. Yes, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I was concerned about the uh, calculations for the cost of this IGA. Um, we apparently are going to be picking up 40% uh, of the court supervisor's salary uh, and 50% of the bailiff's salary as a um, part of this contract. And I just like to understand um, if we are providing 40% um, of the court time, then we should be paying 40% of the court supervisor's salary and 50% of the bailiff's. Is that, in fact, accurate? Uh, what was the history of this IGA, and is it still justified at these levels? 
I can address that, <coughs> uh, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. Um, rough estimate, or historically, um, the city has been charged 40 percent of the shared cost of the consolidated court. Um, depending on the case numbers, it's roughly 40 to 50 percent of the cases um, that but split between the um, the justice court and the city court, realizing that the justice court has other functions. The city court's primarily limited to criminal and civil citations that go into the court. The justice court obviously handles things like small claims and injunctions and things like that. So it, it's a rough, rough estimate of, of the percentage of cost for um, the court administrator and the, uh, and the bailiffs. Um, hi the history of this is, let me just sort of back up a little bit. Um, the city charter or the, the state law mandates that cities have a city court. Um, it also allows us to enter into an IGA with the justice of the peace that's it, located in the city to share some, uh, it's, a, it's, it's not really cons consolidated, that's kind of a misnomer. Um, it's sort of a, it, it's a cooperative, cooperative type agreement. So we can share some services with the, the justice of the peace. Um, but the city has to have a separate court, not only under state law, but then the charter talks about um, that the city shall have a city court. All the employees of the city court um, are, are um, appointed by and accountable to the city judge. Um, obviously, we share this, you know, the judge is also the justice of the peace, so they're the, and we pay for that separately. Um, and so, and then, and then our, our city code also has sort of those same kind of mandates. So the, the cost of the, um, the shared costs are roughly 38,000 um, that, we, that we share with the county um, is, you know, and it, the history of that is it's been, is that the city doesn't have to have a separate space uh, for a court. The city doesn't have, se have to have separate court administrator or bailiffs. The city doesn't have to have separate court security. Um, and as you can imagine, not all city courts have metal detectors and armed security guards. But in this day and age, I, I wouldn't go into a court <laughs> unless there were. I mean, it, you know, it, it's, it's obviously something that um, all those other services that are sort of collateral are also benefit, I think, the city employees and the city court. So the, you know, in our view, the, the, normally we do this for a, tr a number of years. Um, I think that there is some move or some d discussion, the reason it's only a one-year deal is that the presiding judge is, is concerned about, or, um, about this continuing this arrangement. Um, and so it's a one-year deal at this point um, because if the county chooses, if the presiding judge chooses not to go forward, we're gonna have to um, you know, find space, find security, all those costs we're gonna have to probably incur, um, you know, and, and it's, a, it's a, I know my prosecutors are over there at least two full days a week, um, and, and then they're over there on diff Mondays, or two, sorry, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and then they're over there on, you know, sort of intermittently on other days of the week, so roughly, you know, two, two and a half days a week, so 50% of the time it's a city, it's a city court with city cases. Um, the county, the, the, J, the JP has about, I think we have seven clerks and the Justice of the Peace has about uh, 13, so we're, you know, anywhere from a third to a half of the cases. So it, it, num it's not an exact, I don't think it's an exact science, but it's. Well, I think it's kind of an unusual type of a, an agreement. Um, I don't see any dollar amounts on here other than an assumption that the uh, salaries are are consistent and that the uh, costs are reasonable. Um, so at this point, I just have to assume that. Councilman, I see the cost being $19,000, right? 19,062. That's facilities fee. Okay. But that's what, that's the IGA is for the facilities, right? And the percentage of salaries, I think right. we had quantified okay. that. Yeah. I don't know that it's, in, has that been added to the agenda item? 
I just don't know when the last time this was uh, looked at and, and kind of audited to make sure that the tax dollars are, are reasonable. And, Mary, did you uh, want to speak to this a little bit? And projectable. The cost sharing is 40%, I believe, 40, 45% of the bailiff salary and the court administrator, which comes to about 36000 plus the IGA costs of eighteen. So that's, uh, what, 54000 a year? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And it's a and again it's a one this, at this point it's usually a multi year arrangement but like I said it's there's sort of rumblings out there that the county the the, the court the just the sorry the um, presiding judge may or may not want to continue with this type of arrangement so that's why it's only a one year arrangement at this point so we I, we recommend approval simply because frankly we have no we have no choice sure. at this point. <laughs> Um, and, and historically, it's been a, it's it's been a it's it's been a very workable arrangement. Um, I, I think that I get, and I'll defer to Mary Jacobson, but I think historically, the city clerk. Well, we don't pay for their clerks, but um, you know, I, it's I, I kind of think it's 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 a not a, it's a good deal for the city in my view. I think we have six full-time clerks right now. Is that correct and we've got a full-time temp we did a cost analysis when judge markham <clears throat> was the judge three years ago and it made absolutely perfect sense that we shared those costs because we didn't have to find the space mm -hmm. we didn't have to have a full-time person and frankly he brought it to our attention that it was to the benefit of the county as well as the city to con continue to function this way so that's why it has been this way all along. Yeah, and it's it's my, a sharing of costs. It is. Yeah. My, it's my impression, though, that as, as and again, I, I may be wrong on this, but as the justice court gets busier and busier, it, 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 may, it may squeeze us out um, in, sometime, sometime down the road. So um, we're obviously kind of keeping an eye on that because we wouldn't, we, we would want more than a two or three month period if, if we're not going to renew this next time. To you know, to obviously we need to make arrangements somewhere to find space and get all the security in place, which which could be yeah. co could be costly. Seems pretty common sense that it's yeah. to our advantage. But uh, Councilman Lamerson, thank you, uh, Councilman Blair hit it right on the nail head. Uh, we went through this <laughs> lock, stock, and barrel here a few years ago, and that it's to the city's advantage not to have our own city judge and city this and city that, but in a cooperative effort to work with the county. And as long as our attorneys can work with their attorneys, it's in our advantage to do this. And I think the the difference between the 40% and the 50% is the, it's simply the amount of time that the court supervisor spends on county versus city and the bailiffs are roughly split down the middle. So that's kind of how the, uh, generally the, the, the the pro rata share is kind of figured out. It's a 50-50 on the bailiffs because essentially it's, you know, half the time. Um, is, you know, they're, like I said, we're our, my prosecutor's over there roughly two and a half days a week, give or, you know, give or take. Sure. So half the five days of the week. Well, that sounds Thank reasonable. I just, uh, in my professional experience, I've seen contracts that are constantly renewed over a period of time based upon an initial justification that, has gone away and nobody bothers to uh, look at that basis to make sure that it continues to be um, reasonable and consistent so I think uh, thank I, I, you. I, I, I'm comfortable that are, the the justification is still there um, in fact as this this you know as you can see from the report we've had you know five and ten year agreements right. it's a one-year agreement so my concern is that if it does go away um, it could it, the up the the startup cost you know of of starting a court a city court could be considerable, um, not the least of which is whether or not the JP can could be our city judge whether we'd have to hire a separate person as the city judge and so it's a lot of a lot that would go into the mix. Right. Uh, I understand Councilman Good's concern that we're just sort of rubber stamping a renewal, um, but you know this has sort of been vetted and and at this point we recommend that it it go forward because. It is a relatively small cost to continue operations, um, and we'll have to see what happens with as we move forward over this next year, whether or not the the, the Judge Mackey and the court's going to proceed forward with this arrangement or not. Well, let's hope they do. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. 
Any other co comments? Do I have a motion? Mayor Pro Tem, I move to adopt resolution 2018-1634. Second. Please vote. I vote in favor. Passes 6-0. Thank you. Councilman Good, you also pulled item D. Uh, yes, Mayor Pro Tem, I was, um, I was just curious on this proposal that um, this 51 unit facility is going to be uh, primarily used for low income and veterans. So I wanted to find out exactly what the plans were for veterans housing in this uh, proposal. I didn't see any. Sure. They're actually councilman good. Analysis other than a reference to it. You're right. Uh, there is a representative from Catholic Charities, the executive director here for the local office. Thank you, sir. Could you state your name? My name is Daryl Reynolds. I'm the uh, director of Catholic Charities in Yavapai County. Now, the, um, the breakdown uh, numbers that I have received is that uh, there will be at least 30 of those units that will house veterans. Uh, there could be more, depending on, because the other uh, are designated for seniors, and if somebody's a senior and a veteran, Sure. Much better. So, what is the criteria for a veteran to apply for one of these units? And um, to, if you can describe that, that'd be good. Well, um, the complete criteria I I don't have with me, but basically they have to be a uh, a veteran who uh, has been. Uh, um, in, in service and has been uh, discharged with other than dishonorable um, and who um, will abide by the rules uh, of the community there. So we can expect that pro approximately 60% um, of these units will be occupied by qualified veterans. That is correct. Good. And just for the public's information, we are uh, adopting a, a resolution to endorse um, an application for, by Catholic Charities. And it looks like a wonderful project. I think it's 51 units. It uh, will be a new facility on Gurley. So you're tearing down an old facility and putting this one there? Well, uh, that's, uh, that's still being uh, worked on. Okay. There's, uh, All right. A historical uh, tag that uh, is being looked at. Uh, the, the most recent um, uh, drawings I've seen, uh, I think version eight or something, shows that uh, most of the existing building would remain. Okay, very good. Very good. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from council? Yes, ma'am. Um, this is an app. This is an endorsement of you guys applying for the grant. Yeah. We're not endorsing the grant or anything. We're just endorsing the application. you guys applying for a grant. I've been through this many times. I understand okay. that. So <laughs> I just I just don't want the residents out there to think we're rubber stamping um, what you're doing. What we're doing is saying it's okay to go apply for a grant. That's all we're doing. Yep. And if I you understand. get the grant, then we come back to the drawing board. I understand Exactly. That. All right. No, I'm really happy that you're doing this. Uh, housing for veterans is at a premium. In our city, we have probably over 190 homeless veterans that actually live in the forest that we see at the annual stand down in September that come in for uh, uh, services provided there. So um, the more opportunities we have for a, uh, a warm place and a roof over their heads is something I heartily enjoy. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. We appreciate it. So, do I have a motion? Mayor Pro Tem, I move to adopt resolution number 2018-1635. Second. Second. Please vote. I vote in favor. Thank you, Mayor. Passes 6-0. Now we will move on to the liquor license agenda and uh, special events. We're doing this a little differently today. 
Uh, Maureen's going to list the events up on the screen and just briefly go through them. So, Mayor and Council, there are four special events on this agenda. The first one is for the Dancing from the Stars and located at Marina Street. The second one is for Whiskey Basin Trail Run, and that event is going to be April 14th. The Dancing for the Stars is also April 14th. The number three is the annual fundraising gala, and that is March 24th. And the last one is the Whiskey Off-Road Bike Race, which is going to be the 27th, 28th, and 29th of April. Excellent. Thank you. Do I have a motion? Mayor Pro Tem, I move to forward special event liquor license applications 9A.1 and, and 9A.4 to the Arizona State Liquor Board. Second. Through, Vote, please. I vote in favor. Passes 6 0. And I just would like to add that our mayor is one of the dancers <laughs> for the Dancing for the Stars, and so he needs your vote. <laughs> right, Mayor? He better be dancing. <laughs> now we'll move on to our regular agenda and item 10A. Approval of FY19 reinstatement of employee vision insurance. Mary and Council, I'm Mary Jacobson, HR Director. And I'm bringing this item to you to request reinstatement of vision insurance for city employees. This approval is being requested early in the budget process due to the fact we're preparing open enrollment insurance forms as we speak for distribution to employees in early May. However, the benefit will not take effect until July 1 of this budget year. As a brief background, vision insurance was discontinued in 2010 during, due to the economic downturn. For the last eight years, employees have not had vision insurance as part of their benefit package. We are the only entity in the four-member Yavapai Trust, meaning Chino Valley, Yavapai College, and Yavapai County, that does not provide optional vision insurance. The class and comp study was completed in 2015 with pay plan implementation effective July 3rd of 2016. Phase two was, was to be the consideration and possible implementation of the benefits portion of the study. As a result of the surveys and focus groups involving 353 city employees at the time, 93% said that vision coverage was the number one benefit they would like to see added back to their benefits. The lack of vision insurance is often a comparison employees make when considering employment with our peer employers and many times noted as a negative on exit interviews when employees do leave the city. Based on prior enrollment, we can safely say that about 450 employees will opt for vi vision insurance if offered. Pardon me? She's putting the mayor back. Okay. The gross I'm back. Sorry about that. The gross premium cost would be about $160,000 to the city with a shared premium cost for family coverage by the employee of about $8 per pay period, reducing the city's cost by about $57,000, netting the city to about $103,000 for the premium. The cost also depends on what coverage the employee chooses and where the employee works at the city. A good estimate would be that 49.6% would come out of the general fund and 50.4% from other funds. If council approves vision insurance for FY19, it will be a positive response to employee requests, a benefit that will assist with family health care costs, and most certainly be a morale boost and retention incentive. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Go for it. Any questions or comments? Uh, I have a comment. Um, so the calculation would be approximately $50,000 coming from the general fund to support this um, reinstatement of benefits. Is that correct? Correct. Um, quite frankly, um, this is one of my concerns when Proposition 443 was passed, that uh, there would be a continuing uh, demand on general fund dollars uh, and I, for one, made a pledge to the voters that I would not support 
any programs or costs for the general fund other than essential services. Um, although I think this is a reasonable benefit and it's very common, um, until we get this PSPRS liability paid down to the level that we consider manageable, uh, I do not support any additional claims against general fund revenues. So I think uh, virtually everybody on this panel at some time during the campaign made similar claims, and I for one intend to uh, uphold my pledge. So I would vote no on this. Councilman Blair. Well, on the back of our employees, I don't <clears throat> support that same vision. Uh, our employees took it in the short, so to speak, down downturn of the economy. Mark, how, how much are we up in the general fund percentage with our sales tax revenues, regardless of PSPRS? Yeah, this year we're about 5%, five, 5.5% um, five five up so far. So what does 5.5% five and five and a half percent mean dollar-wise? Um, tough one, huh? About uh, seven hundred thousand. Okay. So, so we're up seven hundred thousand. We're talking about fifty-seven thousand, and what we discussed during campaigns had to do with we wanted to stabilize the general fund. All right. Right. Along with Blair, I happen to agree. You know, we we fed off the backs of our employees. We asked these people to come do all the wet work day in and day out, and I think we owe it not only to the citizens of Prescott but to the employees to keep everything whole. Part of everything whole is mean keeping our employees whole too. It's not just about $57,000. Any other comments? Any time that you can boost your morale and, and retain and attract employees to this organization that are passionate about Prescott, I think there's a benefit. And if, if we're losing employees over something as simple as vision insurance or they're being attracted to another employer because of that, I think we, we have a responsibility to take care of our employees. Mayor, do you have any comments? Well, I support this kind of thing. You know, we talk about essential services, and uh, I think it's essential that we take care of our staff. And so I would definitely support this kind of thing. Thank you. You know, the cost of training is tremendous. And there for a while, we had a revolving door at our city. And we have stabilized the general fund. And, and I would say, Councilman Good, I worked very hard to get Proposition 443 passed, made a commitment to the citizens that we're going to pay down this unfunded liability and stabilize our general fund and bring our city where we need to be. And we are going to do that. And I, I truly do not see where providing this um, benefit to our employees will stop that from happening. So I just want to make that statement because I committed fully to paying down the unfunded liability, and I will keep doing that. At the same time, I know common sense says we need to keep our employees, we need to be competitive. And because the training is expensive, we're actually starting to get tra employees back that have left the city and gone to other cities. They're coming back. And so I, I think we want to do everything we can to, to keep them here. So I'm fully supportive of, of passing this. Oh, so do I have a motion? You have public comment. Go, oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Any cards for public comment? No okay. mayor pro tem. OK. Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem, I recommend action to approve reinstatement of vision insurance coverage for employees as part of Phase 2 classification and compensation implementation, effective July 1, 2018. Second. Please vote. I vote in favor. Passes 5-1. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, now we'll go to um, item B. Approval. Approval, Approval of ARC donation agreement with the Rotary Club of Prescott. I'm Candace Tomlinson. I'm the Rotary Club of Prescott president this year. And I um, wanted to just emphasize the importance of this piece of artwork. It was in appreciation of our club 
participating in one of the very first global peace projects. And um, it was designed by a Rotary member in Cuernavaca, Mexico. And it was for a project, um, and well, the peace grants are hard to um, come by because they're hard to quantify. But our project um, was working at reducing violence in the communities through a uh, poster system and also with training local law enforcement and developing a rapport between the citizens and law enforcement because in many cases they were not reporting crime because law enforcement just did nothing. So um, it has had great impact. It was started in six states and it's now being expanded to others. So um, we were very pleased that the Art and Public Places um, accepted this to be uh, displayed in the library and um, we're glad you have it down as a, as a move to accept. Thank you, Candace. Tyler, would you like to add anything from the committee? Very good. And this is already has a spot uh, that's been destined for the library. So very good. So any comments from the council? Do I have a motion? Pro Tem. <clears throat> I move to approve the art donation agreement between the city uh, using city contract number 2018-184 with the Rotary Club of Prescott. Second. Please vote. I vote in favor. Passes 6-0. We appreciate all Rotarians being a Rotarian. We have several on our council, so thank you very much. Now we'll move to item C. Award city contract to Truesdale Corporation for the North Tank East Rehabilitation Project. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council, Eric Bay, Public Works. Uh, this next item is uh, for the rehabilitation of one of our more important uh, water assets, the North Tank East. Uh, this concrete tank uh, holds approximately three million gallons of uh, cold, clean, and delicious Prescott drinking water. Um, it operates pretty well for our uh, city operations staff, but after all these years, uh, it needs some upgrades, so we're upgrading some hatches. Uh, the vent for operational purposes, replacing some valves, uh, adding a drain pipe, bringing the overflow up to standard, etc. cetera. Um, City of Prescott uh, operations normally uh, performs this sort of rehabilitation work, so we have uh, funding available in the water fund. Um, and of course, city staff has sat down with the contractor. We're comfortable with the contract and recommending award at this time. And with that, if you have any questions, I'll answer them now. Councilman Blair? <clears throat> is that water tank you speak of on Mingus? Uh, it's on uh, Douglas officially okay. at Willow Creek Road, pretty close to your residence. Yeah, I used to swim in it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's why we're... Uh, <laughs> Just back in the day, that would, is kind of a funny story, but there used to be a fire department up there, and the old Quonset Hunt concrete tank had a hatch on it that didn't work, and we did used to swim in it. So uh, I, w I will support this effort. <laughs> Hatch replacement uh, will include uh, security hasp for locking the access to the tank. We still have the sign with his picture on it and the red slash through it. <laughs> <laughs> that would be good. Any other comments from council? Okay. Do I have a motion? Mayor Pro Tem, I move to award city contract number 2018-181. Second. Please vote. I vote in favor. Passes 6-0. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And thank you for sending me that video on pipe bursting. Oh, yeah, no, <laughs> Appreciate no. it. Okay, and we will go on now to item D. Approval of ESP grant application for Corsair Connector Project. Good afternoon, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. This item before you is a request to submit an application to the Arizona Commerce Authority Economic Strengths Project Grant in the amount of $500,000. Uh, staff's proposed project is to improve connectivity within the Prescott Airport uh, Air Park area, and our proposal for this project is quite simply to connect Corsair Avenue to Wilkinson Drive.
So I have a map up here to give you an idea of what we're proposing. Um, over the years, of more, as more companies have relocated to this area, it has become apparent that connectivity is lacking. There is only a single access in and out of the air park area, and there's no looping component, and uh, it dead ends currently at the end of Corsair Avenue. So this project is being proposed to alleviate uh, the situation. It calls for the co construction of a connector right through here, this yellow dotted line here, um, that would join Corsair Avenue to Wilkinson, and the addition of creating the roadway will not only relieve the heavy truck traffic that we're seeing, but it will um, allow a second shorter direct access to the southeast end of the business park. With this improvement, uh, we believe our existing businesses can continue making their significant contributions to our local economy, and the um, new roadway would also allow some undeveloped parcels to be available for um, marketing which would open them up for potential new investment. The estimated cost of this project is $750,000. Uh, the grant does require a 10% match. So we're asking for 500,000 from the ESP grant. That's the maximum award that will be allowed and the balance to come from the streets fund. The grant does have a 10% matching component, which is $75,000, which um, would more than be exceeded by the city's contribution to this project. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Councilman Blair. I think um, being out there quite a bit that I am, that's it's long overdue. And I would support that 100%. And, and I guess it would be okay to ask the question until Mr. Palladini stops me, but the other connectivity part out there on Center Point East at the roundabout to Walden Farms and all that connectivity in there, when is that going to take place? Do we have an idea on that yet? I think that would be something for future discussion. <laughs> I knew you'd get I knew you'd get it. I tried, I tried. I, thank you, Wendy. Yes, sir. Any other? Councilman, I, I support this project as well. It certainly is uh, needed for continuing economic development in the airport area. Uh, but I understand we are approving this subject to the award of this uh, $500,000 grant. Correct. The correct? request is for permission to apply for the grant today, sir. Just, I think just to clarify, this is authorization to apply for the grant. If the grant's awarded, then we would have to go out to bid, and then that construction contract would come back to the city with an actual cost, 500000 of which would be covered by the grant, and the, ba the balance due would be covered by the city streets fund. So there's a whole second step to this Great. if the city gets the grant. Great. Thank you. Councilman Schull? What, what are our likelihoods? It's a woman, I'm sorry. It's okay. Councilman woman, <laughs> uh, What do you think our likelihood of being awarded the grant is? Um, well, 50-50. Um, okay. <laughs> um, you know, it's hard to say. It, it is a competitive grant, so communities all over the state could be applying for this. Um, in the past, uh, the pool has been very small for applicants. You do have to have a project that's ready to go. Mm -hmm. This is a project that's been contemplated for quite some time, um, and, and we are ready to go okay. if, we, if we are awarded the grant. Councilwoman Scholl, as a follow-up to what Wendy is saying, we have been awarded a grant for this project before. And turned it down. Um, we actually, did we receive the money, Wendy, or did we just turn we it down? We did not. We got approved, but we did not receive the money because at that time, the estimated construction cost included a lot of bells and whistles that were unnecessary for the connectivity, and our portion was much higher. Mm -hmm. um, we've right-sized this along with a lot of other projects to just make sure we get the asphalt down. Mm -hmm. So the good news is that this project was viewed by the ACA as a favorable project in the past. Good. Any other questions, comments? So, Wendy, how long exactly is this? Like a mile, less than a mile? I think it's about 2,200 feet. I'm okay, about a half a mile. Yeah, about okay. 2,200 feet. So, and understand it's going to be wide. Wide enough for a semi truck. With big trucks, yes. absolutely. Great. Mm -hmm. Very good. So, n with no other comments, do I have a motion? Mayor Pro Tem, I move to approve submission of ESP grant application to Arizona Commerce Authority in the amount of $500,000. Second. Please vote. I vote in favor. Passes 6 0. Thank you, Mayor. And, Mayor, we missed you today, but we're glad that you're on the phone with us. 
and, and, and the mayor's tradition. I have. You got one more item. Do we have one more item? I'm sorry. Oh, we have the legislature. Hey, how, how, Tyler, how, yeah. how, can how could I forget Tyler? Down. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. And how could I, uh, we ever forget the legislature? You all right? Mayor, go ahead, Mayor. Yeah. Mayor, go ahead. With all, due respect, with all due respect to Mr. Goodman there, I think I'm going to step aside at this point, and I will get caught up with him when I get back to town. Yeah, well, we, we don't want to spoil your dinner, so go ahead. <laughs> thank you for joining us. i got to go back. Yeah, thank you so much. You guys have a great, great day. Bye. Sorry, Tyler. That's okay. Not I was, that I, I don't want to hear from the legislature. I was getting out of it today, and <laughs> I'm, I'm okay with that, though. I'm, I'm here, so happy to report. Um, again, I'm not going to go through every single bill on this list. We'll kind of jump around. Uh, the first section I will go through, because these are the top ones of interest that I've heard from council. The first one being Senate Bill 1262. This has to do with that assumed rate of return for PSPRS. It would bring it down from the current 7.4 to roughly 4.7 over the years and would have a financial impact. Um, the only thing of note is that there was an amendment made to it um, so that PSPRS would not be able to increase the assumed rate of return in the future unless its overall funding was 80% or above. So that's some movement on that. Um, it did pass out of its Senate committee, but has not been considered by the Senate as a whole yet. Um, and honestly, there hasn't been a ton of movement on all these bills, um, but there should be because as you see at the top, March 23rd is the last day to hear bills in the opposing chamber. So in the next 10 days, we're really going to see a lot of movement on all these things. Uh, going down, House Bill 2501, the PTSD Workers Comp Presumption Bill. It did, as I reported last time, pass out of the House. Um, but there is um, some rumblings that in the Senate it's going to have a lot harder of a time. And um, the, the first sign of that is that it's been assigned to two committees, which typically means that it gets twice the scrutiny and it's twice as hard to get through. And so they're gonna be looking at this a lot more closely, I believe, than the House did. And um, the League is working really hard on this one. And if, if not to get it altogether killed, um, to get it improved so that we can provide adequate PTSD services uh, without breaking the bank, so to speak. So I'll keep you guys updated on that as well. Um, moving down the sober living home bills, there's two versions, the House bill and the Senate bill, both have passed out of their chambers so far and the senate bill most recently passed just last week 29 to 0 and it did have the amendments that john spoke about last time from the stakeholder meeting uh, which really improved it a lot and so that's a positive note and both those things look to be moving forward patient referral bill or the patient brokering uh, maybe in better terms uh, it did pass out of the senate and it has been assigned to the house health committee but hasn't had a hearing yet but i assume again in the next 10 days that that will um, consolidated election dates. This is the Speaker's bill. Again, it did pass out of the House, um, but it was amended, and Barry worked on this for us so that if this does happen to pass and get signed by the governor, um, it would hold us harmless in that our um, expenditure limitation um, renewal wouldn't be affected, that we wouldn't be penalized if we go over a year because of the switching of dates, and that's just putting all the other constitutionality and charter uh, concerns aside. So Tyler, before we move on, is, is the League still working hard to try to do what they can to defeat this? This one... Or are they giving up? Uh, this one, it's, it's not being pushed super hard by the League. I don't, I don't see it that way. Um, it does affect relatively few cities, um, and I suspect that if it passes that those few cities will band together as they have in the past and, and try to go after this through the courts. It's, it's disappointing um, that it passed the House the way it did. and. Councilman Blair? Do you well, I, you know, I, I know we, and, and John probably will disagree with me, he always does, but, you know, we have an attorney general, and I think that rather than let garbage bills, in my opinion, like this, see the light of day without any respectful comment by the highest level attorney for the state of Arizona where they're infringing upon our rights, I, I don't think it should even have gotten there. I mean, a lot of stuff that comes to us, we have to check with him before we do it. Right. So it should go vice versa with the highest level of, a, of an attorney for the state, and I just think it's, I think it's a joke. Is, is there any way, if, if the league isn't doing something about is there any way that we as a city can send letters to our, I mean, I've contacted individually, but 
um, to say. You know, the city council could take a, a position uh, formally you know, in opposition to a particular bill. Um, this one's got a, a, a lot of constitutional issues, as was mentioned before. Um, the the amendment, although it sort of benefits us, is a question because of voter turnout. Constitutional because the expenditure limitations, oh. a constitutional provision. The, it, it's it's obviously different than before because it has those triggers that if you if you're under a certain percentage of statewide elections, only then does does the consolidation requirement apply. I, I think Prescott's well above it those is. numbers and may never be affected by it. The, uh, the problem with it is, um, well, you, you never, you can never go back. So once you're consolidated, obviously you can never go back. Right. So um, it, it, these things tend to be partisan in nature. In other words, if you're obviously. voting in a partisan election, you know, and you have a city election that's during a partisan election, it's going to fade. It, you know, depending on the jurisdiction, it's going to favor one, generally one party or the other. Um, unless they're a balance, unless it's a balanced community, but um, uh, we can certainly wait to see. You sort of see what happens on it. I, I actually am kind of surprised that the league's not taking a more aggressive stance Me against too. it. But as Tyler was saying, all of the general law cities, so all but 19 charter cities, are already consolidated, right? And then the the 19 charters are only affected if if their turnouts are certain under a certain percentage. So it may be a rather small number. So uh, I have a, <clears throat> who do I have first? I have you, Jim. Thanks. <laughs> Councilman Lamberson. I, Who's Tyler, number five? I don't know. <laughs> let, let, let's get right down to the bottom line here. <clears throat> the league is made up of how many cities and where are they, most of them located? Where is the membership the biggest? It's right. down in the valley. And who's would be gourd, whose ox would be gourd, so to speak? Um, the biggest from a political, and this is an election year. Fact of the matter is the league's not gonna play with it because their membership is hugely impacted by Maricopa County. Thank you. Uh, and, and it is the speaker's bill. So a lot of the representatives are not gonna vote against the speaker's bill for their own future ish concerns. Right? Especially when it doesn't affect most of That's their right. cities, yeah. Well, thank you for the discussion, so we should probably just move on. Okay. Thank you. And then last but not least is the flat out requirements um, bill. Councilman Good has been in contact with the chair of the committee. It's actually being heard probably as we speak, if not pretty soon, um, in the Senate Transportation Committee. And Barry Ahrens and his staff are there on our behalf, it being a council day, so he'll be there to testify for that. And then going down, I'm not going to go through all these. I'll jump through it. And, Tyler, uh, just one Tyler, second. I did yeah. want to mention the fact that the other essential air service uh, airport in the state in Sholo, their city council uh, approved and supported this at their own meeting last week uh, unanimously. So uh, we're starting to see some support, and I think we've gotten a response from another EAS uh, airport in Colorado supporting the issue. So. Um, it's a big battle. It'll take a long time, but uh, we're moving forward. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. that f uh, the first bill on the other, uh, the others bill list, House Bill 2500, this is the real estate signs one. And um, I know the league and their attorney and their staff have been working on this one and working with um, many attorneys from across the state. Um, it did pass out of the House. And if you remember, this one will allow real estate signs to be in city right of way. It doesn't really allow us to diminish their capacity size, um, obviously not content, um, all those things, but it really opens the floodgates because we can't discriminate based on content. It wouldn't just be for real estate, it would open it up uh, to all cities and towns. And what the league is saying is, is that from what they're finding in conversations is that uh, the, the legislature, this won't surprise you, just doesn't care uh, that it will do that and that it takes away the authority of the local governments to dictate what their right of ways look like, how much clutter they want and all of that. Um, so it has momentum, and it did pass out of its Senate committee. It hasn't gone through the Senate rules yet, but once it does, then it will go to the Senate as a whole. And so we'll see. Um, but this is one that the league is working very hard on, just not making a lot of grounds on it. So we'll keep you posted. But uh, Let's jump next page. Uh, the home-based businesses. This passed out of the House. It's, been, it's another one of those bills that's been assigned to two committees uh, in the Senate. So it could have a harder time getting through. 
Uh, the league has worked very hard on this one, but again, hasn't made much headway with it um, as far as amendments with its sponsor. It is on the agenda for, I believe, the Commerce and Public Safety Committee in the Senate for this week, um, trying to push amendments to make it reasonable so that neighborhoods maintain their neighborhood feel. And currently, cities and towns across the state don't really impose a lot of restrictions on home-based businesses. So, so the league is saying, well, then why, why start um, diminishing the ability for us to maintain it, even though we're not going out there and... Alan, don't you hard. kind of find that a little bit humorous? They, they don't mind cluttering up our neighborhoods and our ability to feel like we live at home, full of a lot of political signs from Phoenix coming up here, garbaging our rights away, et cetera, and yet they, they want to stick their nose in at a different level on home-based business and say, gosh, you know, they just, to me it seems oxymoronic and some of what the legislature is doing here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> right. Yes. And I'm going to jump down a few to House Bill 2479. This is the transaction privilege tax on digital goods and services, and this distinguishes between those services that are downloaded onto your computer, your hard drive, versus those that are accessed on the internet, it would stop uh, the collection of sales taxes on those that are accessed via the web, like a Netflix or other streaming services, music, videos, things like that. Um, big impact to cities. The estimate right now is about 33 million to cities, and even larger to the state, even though we don't have our arms around that number. Uh, so we'll see how far it goes. I think with that impact, that could slow it down quite a bit, especially if it's a large impact to the state. Do we know what the impact might be to Prescott? To Prescott, we do. Um, I know Lars prepared it, but I can't remember off the top of my head. I, I'm going to guess a few hundred thousand if I remember right, um, but I, I could get that number for you okay. more specifically. Yeah. And then the last one I'm going to talk about, House Bill 1499. This, again, is the CFD and the directors. Um, it's been assigned to the Senate Commerce Committee, uh, which was being held uh, today, probably around this afternoon. So we're keeping an eye on that one. That's another good bill. So I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Questions, comment? Hearing none, thank you, Tyler. Nice job. Thank you for staying on top of these. Um, in the tradition of Mayor Mingarelli, I have a quote for today, and the quote I have is from Frances Munns. Frances um, married John Munns in Cottonwood in 1890. They moved to Prescott, and he was the sheriff, and uh, then she was worked hard for the women's vote. And in 1914, at the age of 48, she was elected state senator for Arizona from Yavapai County, uh, the first woman to be state senator in Arizona, and the second woman to be state senator in the United States. And this is her quote. I love this. And I'm going to thank Cindy Parks for this. Thank you, Cindy. We believe that we have proved ourselves worthy of the ballot. Woman has have been, I think maybe women, but women have been earnest in their endeavors to support the best candidates and to work by the right means for the right measures. We are adjourned. Thank you. Don't you love that?